So welcome to Design.Different, a week of inclusive design events at the Royal College of Art in London, hosted by the Helen Hamlin Center. We are in the middle of the events, as you can see from the screen. We've had um, two events, three events already, and we've got another two events to come on Thursday and Friday. This session that you are in is called Inclusive Design for Social Impact. And it's one of the most important, and dare I say it, most subscribed sessions that we've put online. I'm Rama Girawa. I'm the director of the Helen Hamlin Center for Design, and I've been working in inclusive design all my life. And partnering with me to co-host this is our new visiting scholar, Sean Donahue. Sean from Art Center College of Design. Good, good morning from where I am, everyone. <laughs> so Sean's in LA and I'm in the UK. Um, Sean and I are both active designers. Um, I wanted to be a designer since I was 14. And on the left, you see a picture of me going out, conducting some research, talking to people as part of a project we did with a London taxi. And no, that is not a gun. It's a video camera that I'm pointing to Fiona, um, filming her as she talks through some of her insights. And Sean, did you want to introduce a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, uh, much, much like Rama, I've been um, working uh, with inclusivity um, for the last um, uh, two decades. Um, and uh, a lot of my, most of my work has been, um, uh, as Rama will talk about um, in other places, uh, asking questions around um, these conditions within a kind of global uh, context. So inclusive design was defined by the British government in the year 2000 is including the needs of the widest number of people in your design. You know, the UK government doesn't get everything right, but this, I think they did. And if we could start off just to take the temperature of the room, we're gonna start off with a poll. So can we have our first poll and can all participants please vote? So the poll is this should inclusive design address a wider range of social issues beyond age and ability? And you've got five options. Strongly agree, agree, not sure, disagree, and strongly disagree. It's like watching a live auction. <laughs> the results are kind of sort of sort of struggling with each other, but I think it's going between strongly agree is up there at 66%, followed by agree at 29%. Um, and then, you know, there's a mere kind of 6% in the not sure to the dis disagreement. So that explains why many of you are here on this session. So we can share results. Can you all see the results? So I wasn't making it up. Right. So there is a problem with design. There's two words in inclusive design. One of them is design. And it's this, if you type the word designer into any text application, on your smartphone, this comes up as a predictive image. You know, it's sort of French people from the 1940s holding a paint paintbrush. But designers, we're more than artists, we're strategists, we're frameworkers, we're, enable we're enablers, we're facilitators, we're researchers. And that componentry of design is something that's incredibly powerful. Design is about people, people of all ages and abilities, yes, but a wider range of diversity um, is also needed. Inclusive design can have a global context, but can also have universal impact. The tools and the frameworks of it really enable this. In 2020, pandemic and protest 
brought issues of exclusion into all of our lives. And we were suddenly challenged in ways that we, we weren't previously. We all believed a wonderful nonsense, like the peacock on the left of the screen, strutting around and looking good. But actually, the, I, I, I love this picture of the chicken on the right. It describes to me some of the texture of inclusive design, doing good. She strapped rockets to her back and is lifting a first aid box somewhere. Inclusive design in a global context can be messy. It can be sometimes feel a little fractured, but it is positive. So we need that shift from looking good to doing good. We also asked, you know, many of the panel members, colleagues asked this question alongside Sean and myself, are we being exclusive with our inclusive practice? In 2007, Sean and I argued that we needed to look beyond age and ability with our inclusive endeavors and look at other instances of exclusion, social, economic, geographic, you know, geography is important. If you fall ill in one part of a city, you'll get a different level of healthcare than in another. You know, sometimes if you fall ill, you may want to take an Uber or a taxi and go to another part of the city, call an Uber, call an ambulance, see who arrives first. Um, there's the financial exclusion, there's by gender and by race. And yes, there is more than two genders. Inclusive design, 30 years ago, universal design and design for all, which are the kind of non-identical twins of inclusive design. It looked a lot like this, majority culture, kind of glamorous granddads and grannies, glamorous older people, kind of enjoying life. And there was a huge barrier to life and still is, massive barriers that we associate with age that are physical, cognitive, sensory, um, you know, emotional, intellectual. The world is just not designed in that way. But a future of inclusive design encompasses this, but may look like that. This is our inclus Include conference from last year. And what I love about this picture is that it's young, black, and female. Sean and I have taken the principles and practice of inclusive de design into many spaces and places. Here we are with migrant workers in Qatar, part of a three-year program, um, looking at how we translate some of the practice into the space there. What does the recruitment process look like? What does the living process look like? And we worked with local universities and NGOs. We have a principle that we never go anywhere without, in the world without working with local partners. We do not want to be Victorian paternalists or missionaries inflicting inclusive design into new spaces and places. We go there to learn more than we actually facilitate. We learn from, from people, we learn about what's going on. We've also um, worked together in Fukushima after the May 2011 disaster, the tsunami. And what happens when your traditional shrine on the right is replaced by a radioactive shrine on the left. How do you attract people back into the community? And we ran a series of workshops and engagement with the citizens of um, the local region to, to, to see how that might work. We came up with six ideas and two of them we presented in front of Tokyo's mayor and the crown princess of Japan. We've also worked in Hong Kong which is an incredible, incredibly vertical city. It's the inspiration for Blade Runner. Aging there is a different cultural experience. Everything about aging, even something we feel we know about, you know, in a Western context is radically different. Going out and speaking to Hong Kong elders, looking at the textures and the types of their lives, the full dimensions of their lived life, and conducting research as a, as, a, as a process of beauty, taking these photographs, bird's eye view shots of um, different spaces and places. You know, the application of inclusive design here has to evolve and change. And one of the ideas we came up with was redesigning the care home bed from something that 
is a place where you go to die, to a place where you can still live. You know, care homes are full of people that have a level of fragility, but out there in Hong Kong, a lot of aspiration, um, a lot of attitude still existed. And, you know, we, we re-engineered the color palettes of the care homes. On the left, you see the color palette, which is really sort of bodily fluids into a color palette that is um, much more effective, much more, uh, you know, speaking to modernity. You know, for instance, the, 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 the dark blue uh, headboard area allows people to rest and be at more ease when they, when they sleep. Within the Helen Hamlin Center for Design, um, we've run a series of projects around community. The one on screen looks at mental health around the city of Derry, um, around the banks of the River Foyle. The, the, the river pretty much div divides Ireland and Northern Ireland, and there's a huge incidence of suicide that um, you see around the banks. We spent um, four years out there and have now created um, a community vehicle. Our researchers actually stayed on in the city and have created a community vehicle with the local mayor um, and the local political parties to take this project forward. And this is the kind of work we want to do. It's not temporary, it's engaging. It's about building trust and building legacy, co-designing with people and letting them use design as a platform for expression. It's not about us telling people what to do. It's about coexisting. So the final slide really is talking, uh, final two slides. One is looking at how we engage with communities. Inclusive design has a history of engaging with the individual, and this is about communities. We have tools in inclusive design that have global application, and we want um, to explore how this might take place. Sean and I are launching this new area, inclusive design for social impact. And we would love to hear your thoughts, your voices, your collaborations on this. This is a new journey and we want to have that conversation with you. We want to walk together. This is the key question. This is the final slide. And it asks how can inclusive design work with individuals and communities to create social impact in a global context? So with that, we start our first presentation, a sort of 10 minute presentation on the first project in this area. And then we will go to three presentations from our panelists followed by a discussion. At this point, I can ask you to please type in your questions into the Q&A function so we can answer them at the end of this session. So the Public Toilets Research Unit looks at an issue that affects us all, sanitation. You know, when you've got to go, you've got to go. And could I invite my colleagues, Joanne Bichard, who's our Professor of Accessible Design, and Gail Ramster, our Senior Research Associate, to please fire up their presentation and tell us about the public toilet scene. Thank you, Rama. Uh, here we go. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody, and, and it's wonderful that you're joining us this afternoon. Um, as Rama said, I'm Joanne, I'm Joanne Bichard, and I'm Professor of Accessible Design here at the Helen Hamlin Centre. Well, not here, I mean, I'm at home, but you get the meaning, you get the, you get the idea. Um, this afternoon, I want to tell you about an exciting new initiative we have at the centre. Um, we're going to have a quick poll, a couple of quick polls during the session, so keep your fingers on that poll option. So the Public Toilets Research Unit is a new design focused unit operating as part of the wider research space exploring inclusive design for social innovation. Currently led by myself and Gail Rampster, who you'll be hearing from next, the PTRU builds on our combined 30 years experience of public toilet research to continue and expand inclusive and people centred design research in this essential public and private space. Now, I mentioned it as an essential public and private space because we often have to make these decisions when we're out about using toilets. So here's our first poll. Do you prefer to use a public toilet, one that 
tends to be standalone operated by a local authority? Or do you prefer to use a toilet that's in a department store, a supermarket, a cafe, etc.? So um, please go ahead and vote for your toilet preference. Those awkward silences as you make decisions. So do we have any votes coming in? Wow. That's incredible. Wow. So it, 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 it goes to show that really the preference of people is very much um, um, for the private provision. Thank you very much for that. That's really interesting. OK, so moving on. Uh, why can't I move on? Ah, right, there we go. Moved on. OK. Um, the public toilet can be considered one of the most complex spaces in our built environment. It is, a, it is effectively a designed artifact that directly meets a biological function. In short, it is a technology of civilization. The fascinating and sometimes for users frustrating aspects of public toilets is that the space's complexity often encompasses a range of design processes. And these might include accessibility, crime prevention, architecture, the built environment, urban planning, service design, product design, transport design, retail design, sustainable design. But what we find is more often than not, it, it uses a singular design process rather than combining with all the others. As such, some of these solutions that deliver robust toilets that deter what we consider non-toileting activities often make the space inaccessible, especially to those who really need to use it. So our aim at the PTRU is to bring all of these design thinking processes together and add a big helping of inclusive and people-centered experience so that any toilet design that is being undertaken can ensure that it meets the needs of every possible user. After all, given that we all share the bi biological need to excrete, what should be more inclusive than a public toilet? So as a, many of you might know, access to public toilets became a central concern during the recent COVID-19 lockdown. And it also has also become a great concern how toilets should safely be opened once lockdown restrictions have been lifted. Gail and I were honoured to be asked to contribute to the British Standards Institute guidance on returning to work do, during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially concerning operating and maintaining toilet provision in all the workplaces. So this brings us to our second quick poll. Um, do you think that there should be more public toilets? Given that you prefer private ones, do you think it would be better if we had more public ones anyway? So let's see how that came out. And the answer is obviously yes and no, and uh, make your decisions. Hopefully we'll have some answers soon. Yes. Wow. So yes came in at 82%. Do think there should be more public toilets and no at 18%. Well, that's really interesting when you consider that actually the preference is for the private provision. I do find that quite fascinating. Gail and I will be chewing on that for weeks, I can assure you. Okay, so moving on. And I can't seem to move on, do apologize for this. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so um, our previous research has been predominantly UK based. However, the PTRU now aims to share what we've learned on a global level as part of our wider involvement with the IDSI. In February this year, I was asked to speak at the United Nations Fifth Safe Cities and Safe Public Spaces Global Leaders Forum about how public toilets can contribute to public space safety for women and girls. 
We are also currently contributing to the WTO, that's the uh, World Toilet Organization, creation of a global standard for COVID-19 safety in toilets. By the way, tomorrow is World, World Hand Washing Day, so don't forget to wash your hands. So these are the activities the PTRU has been undertaking since we set up earlier this year. However, our next big project will be the Toilet Innovation and New Knowledge Exchange, or Tinkle for short. And we are going to live with Tinkle on November the 19th, which happens to be World Toilet Day. Tinkle aims to tackle that fractured knowledge about toilet design I mentioned earlier by bringing together all of the design guides, the standards and the academic research on toilets into one accessible platform. We also aim to bring together the experts behind this knowledge so that designers, researchers, and those who own or operate toilet facilities can contact specific experts with questions about the design and delivery of this essential service. So do come back for a tinkle next month. Anyway, thank you for your attention this afternoon, and I'm now going to hand over to Gail. Thank you, Joanne. I'm uh, Gail Ramster, and I've been a design researcher at the Centre for 11 years, focusing on people-centred and co-design approaches with citizens and communities. And the UK's communities are facing many challenges where public toilets are critical. Living active lives, the health of our high streets, the privatisation of public space, uh, antisocial behaviour, accessibility and inclusion. And yet our research has found that a third of toilets have closed between um, since 2000 and on Saturday the Daily Mail reported that another 300 have closed down during the C19 pandemic. In some places when the councils close the toilets, a local community group will take it on and run the facility, but for many are shut for good or repurposed. In the next few minutes I'll give you a brief introduction to the highs and lows of inclusive design and public toilets using examples from our capital's uh, loos. The fact is, we all rely on toilets so that we can spend time away from our homes. But if you're one of the millions of people in the UK with reduced consonants, you can be limited in where you can go, or even if you can leave the house at all, if you can't be sure a toilet will be available. In the Helen Hamlin Centre's first toilet project, TACT3, we interviewed 100 people, many with continents concerns, about needing, finding and using public toilets. We found that people have very different, sometimes conflicting needs and preferences. So rather than focus on the possibly impossible one design fits all solution, we focused on how we share information about existing toilets to help people to find toilets that suit them. We called this the Great British Public Toilet Map. So what did we include in the map? What is a public toilet? Well, the first type of toilet we included were the 3,000 council-run public toilets, such as this fine toilet with its royal crest, cited somehow inevitably by the bins. We campaigned for councils to publish open data about their toilets via freedom of, freedom of information requests and collated it into a database and map. But what other toilets can the public use? Well, as this map shows, in this part of central London, there are only three nearby council-run public toilets. But we also have to toilets in other public buildings, such as libraries, a town hall, a museum, even maybe a hospital. And there are toilets in privately owned and managed public space, such as shopping centres, train stations and the Royal Parks, as well as in community toilet schemes where British councils are paying businesses to open up their toilets to non-customers. So three public toilets, 24 publicly accessible toilets. We've all seen how important it is to know where toilets are and whether they are open during this pandemic. During the UK's lockdown, our research found that only one of the 33 councils in London had announced that they would keep their toilets open throughout lockdown. This was the city of Westminster, who recognised toilets as critical infrastructure. Our map has now 13,000 publicly accessible toilets and it's run as an RCA spin-out by myself and Joanne and our long-term collaborators, Neon Tribe, through our company, Public Convenience. So we know which toilets um, the public can access now, but are they accessible to everyone? Are they inclusive? Well, before the pandemic, both Westminster and the City of London had reintroduced a 50p fee 
along with paddle gates and turnstiles, even though turnstiles were banned for 40 years because they are not accessible. Toilets are our only source of privacy in the public realm. And so we might visit for lots of different reasons as well as using the toilets. So to cry, to change a sanitary towel, to wash our hands. Is it inclusive to put a price on privacy? We're still finding toilets with UV lights, oops, um, which are a design feature used to deter intravenous drug users from, by making it harder to see veins. Instead, they lead to users injecting more dangerously and create a distressing environment for people with autism. Initiatives to design out crime should still be inclusive. And why do we segregate our toilets by gender? <laughs> when it results in people experiencing embarrassment or abuse if their gender is questioned or misread. It's not like our women's toilets are well designed. Here we see pedestrian modelling for a proposed toilet submitted for London's Oxford Street. The five red dots on the left show architects already knew at this planning stage that women would have to queue for longer. Gender discrimination is being designed into the fabric of toilet buildings. But there are also great examples of public toilet design in London, such as the Olympic Stadium, built to meet their very own inclusive design guide. And more recently, Hackney Council's uh, new facilities by Danfo, such as these in London Fields. They're attractive, accessible, free, all gender, plus a women-only cubicle, private, but not hidden away. Toilets can be thoughtfully, inclusively designed when the issues affecting them are understood and considered. The Welcome Collection's new toilets include changing places toilets for people with profound disabilities, but they've been designed to the same high, high quality aesthetic as the standard all gender facility. And finally, Network Rail. So by charging 50p, they were pulling in one million pounds a year just from Victoria Station's toilets. And then they did a U-turn. They scrapped all charges and spent eight million pounds refurbishing Victoria's loose. These toilets are so beautiful that you should all risk public transport immediately just so you can try them out. Joanne and I have previously captured many tips for bringing inclusive design to public toilets in our inclusive design guide, and we will have a COVID secured second edition that we hope to be able to share with you soon. Thank you, and I will hand back to Sean. Thank you, Joanne and Gail, and uh, thank everyone for the thoughtful questions that they're entering in the chat as they go through. I think this is a, a great way to, to, to start a platform for a conversation that um, we're gonna continue with um, three guests that we've invited um, to be part of the conversation today that Joanne and Gail have launched us off into. I'm, and I'm going to do a quick introduction of each of them and maybe go into some more detailed um, uh, information about them as we uh, e invite each one of them to, to talk for um, roughly seven minutes about um, these issues from the, the amazing work that they're each doing in, in different parts of the world. Um, with us today, we've invited uh, Priya, who is uh, Priya Saha Devan. Uh, she's the head counsel in the legal team at Sky. Sky is Europe's leading media entertainment company and is part of the Comcast Corporation Group. Um, I will invite Priya in a second to um, lead off um, uh, the conversation. Uh, I'm gonna introduce um, Angela as well. Angela Baines is co-founder and strategic director of Transform EXP. Um, she is the graduate program director of Strategic Foresight and Innovation, and she is the professor in decolonizing advertising at the Ontario College of Art and Design in Canada. And lastly, uh, I would like to introduce Gabriela Gomez Mont. Um, she is the founder and director of the Laboratorio para la Ciudad. Um, uh, from 2013 to 2018, and. Uh, it is an award-winning experimental and creative office at the Mexico uh, of the Mexico City government that reported to the mayor. I want to thank you all three for joining us today, um, uh, and um, appreciate the energy that all of you are bringing to to this important conversation um, to start this this platform. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, invite Bria, uh, Priya. Um, and uh, share a little bit more about um, her. Um, Sky's 32,000 employees help connect customers to the very best entertainment, sports, news, arts, and Sky's own original content. And that's important to say, but talk about the scope that Priya is working within this, this um, uh, context. Sky is formally committed to inclusion and recently announced a 30 million pound fund to support anti-racism and improve diversity and inclusion. Since 2017, 
Priya has been central to Sky's legals, Sky Legal's inclusion initiatives, including internal and external mentoring schemes and education programs. And in 2019, Priya was shortlisted by the Law Society as in-house solicitor of the year, both for her achievements in law and her commitment to inclusion. Priya, I, I would like to invite you to, to share some of the amazing um, work that you're doing um, with us, please. Thank you so much, Sean, and thanks to Rama and the RCA for inviting me to be part of the panel today. Um, I'm super excited to be part of this event and look forward to the conversation this afternoon. Um, so as Sean has just explained, I'm Priya Sahadevan. I'm head counsel in the legal team at Sky. Um, but here today, I'm speaking in my personal capacity and, and not on behalf of the company. And so to kick off by answering a few personal questions that may be running through your head. Where am I from? Um, I'm born and raised a Londoner. And where am I really from? Uh, which is often the follow up question. My father was born in Malaysia, but both, both of my parents are of Sri Lankan heritage. And why am I here with you this afternoon? Well, I've been working on inclusion initiatives alongside my legal career for much of my adult life. Um, and as you can imagine, the, the legal profession is one of the most traditional, conservative and non-diverse historically. Um, specifically at Sky, I've been focusing on inclusion since 2017. And I wanted to share with you this afternoon some of our approaches for addressing the different aspects of inclusivity and our experiences of implementing them. So I'm going to share with you three of the initiatives that we've been working on. And the concept that links everything we've been doing has been the attempt to create safe spaces within the working environment. And so to kick off by describing one of our early initiatives, um, we set up within legal, a reverse mentoring scheme. And the premise behind that scheme was that myself and other colleagues from a black, Asian, minority, ethnic background um, would mentor the more senior leaders within the department who were predominantly not from those backgrounds. And the idea was to flip the power dynamic, um, to offer the stage and space to, to people from those different backgrounds, to share their experiences, and also to create an environment where our colleagues felt free to be curious and to ask questions that they might feel uncomfortable asking in an open forum. And that initiative had a lot of unexpected positive impacts. For me personally, as a mentor, it meant that suddenly in the work environment, I was sharing very personal experiences about my family, about how we celebrate, about how we grieve with colleagues at work. Um, and for the first time in my working life, I felt like I was a complete person in the working environment. And um, it also meant that in the course of the exchange, my colleague shared with me some, some very deep experiences from his life that he had never spoken about with anyone in the department. And in that way, we connected and had a conversation where we discovered commonality that we never would have otherwise discovered. Um, as a group of mentors, it also offered us a shared community where we shared the experiences that we were discussing with the people that we were mentoring. And that became a support network and it meant that we could see that individual experiences, microaggressions that we had brushed off um, when we found out that those experiences were in fact mirrored across our mental community, we realized that actually it was something that we should take note of and raise and address within, within the department, which we did. So that's what we were doing internally, um, but we also wanted to focus externally. As I explained, the legal profession historically has not been very diverse. And we set up a mentoring scheme um, to really look at the early years and the pipeline of talent coming through to the profession, because we realized that that was the point that we needed to address the imbalances in the profession. Um, so we are now running uh, an annual mentoring scheme for 
students at university from a Black, Asian and minority ethnic background um, who are socially mobile, often the first in their families to go to university. And we are encouraging them to think about a career in law where previously they might have counted themselves out. And we are hoping through our sessions to give them the tools to navigate some of the complicated recruitment processes of the law firms. That scheme has been really successful to date this year. We've just launched our annual scheme and it's double the size that it was last year. So we're hoping to replicate that success. And I think the most important thing we learned through that initiative was the power of visibility and role modeling. And almost beyond any of the words that came out of our mouths to these students, the fact that they could see in the Sky Legal community someone who was of Sri Lankan heritage, someone who was Ghanaian, someone who was Nigerian, meant that they perhaps for the first time could see themselves in this profession. And I think that, to be honest, was the most positive impact that we had on, on those students. Um, and they say, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And I hope that through the scheme, we will be able to encourage them to see themselves in the profession. And the final thing I wanted to share with you today um, was that this year, and particularly since the horrific events of, of George Floyd in, in the US, we've been trying to bring inclusion more and more into our day-to-day -day activity. So my concern in being initially involved in these initiatives was that they would be seen as something over here for a particular group of people who felt disadvantaged. And actually that just creates a new dynamic of exclusion, which is precisely the opposite of what we wanted to do. So, so now we're trying to bring inclusivity into everything that we do. So we have a monthly discussion forum based on a TED talk. We're introducing diverse voices into that, into our monthly book club. Um, and the other initiatives that we participate in, I coordinate a monthly publication which showcases a different area of the business each month. And after George Floyd, we ran a special edition, which was called Share the Mic, where we interviewed a number of Black colleagues around the organisation and invited them to share their career experiences. And I wanted the process of creating the edition, as well as the end product, to be part of the education opportunity. And so for each small group that interviewed one of our colleagues was drawn from a cross section of um, backgrounds in the department. So that conversation itself in producing the edition um, enabled people to hear firsthand the experience of colleagues from different backgrounds. Uh, so that's really all I wanted to say by way of introduction. Um, the things that we have really drawn on and that I wanted to leave you with were the creation of safe spaces, the importance of visibility and role modeling, and the importance of sewing these different voices into the fabric of what is happening in your organizations day to day. Thank you, Sean, and happy to um, participate in the discussion as we proceed. Thank you, Priya. Um, uh, I just want to say how much, <clears throat> when, I, when I hear you present that again, um, how much uh, the connections already between the, the, the different projects start to emerge, kind of looking at this not just as entry points, but in support mechanisms that are really necessary to not just kind of start a conversation, but really enact something that has longevity and makes a systemic impact in a space. And I think a lot of the things you're talking about um, uh, that extend what visibility is and the support mechanisms for that really kind of echo of that. Um, and so I really um, thank you for sharing that with us today. And I hope we can return to some of these questions as we get into the Q&A at the end. With that, I'd like to introduce Angela Baines. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit more about um, her amazing work. Um, as an instructor of the Strategic Design for Business at the British Columbia Institute of Technology, she was honored with seven teaching awards of excellence. Angela has over 25 years of experience in design, working on social change, including the Free Nelson Mandela campaigns. Commercial clients include BBC Television, Swatch Canada, the Ritz Carlton, with speaking invitations endless, uh, but, but a short list of the Design Management Institute, the International Council of Design, and the Registered Graphic Designers of Canada. 
So both a practitioner and educator, um, Angela, thank you for joining us today. And I invite you to share some of the uh, amazing work that you're doing. Thank you, Sean. And thank you, Rama, as well. So um, I'm just gonna share my screen here and then I will talk about diversity and inclusivity in design. Okay, well, thank you everyone. I wanted to first of all start off with um, an land acknowledgement because I'm actually here in Vancouver, Canada. And I'd like to acknowledge that the land that I live and work on is the traditional unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples of Canada, including the territory, territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, the Musqueam and the Squamish nations. And this is something that's very important to me because if we're talking about inclusivity, uh, we also have to talk about honoring um, the people whose lands we live on as well. And with that, um, like Priya, I also um, would like to acknowledge my own heritage as well. So originally born in the, in the UK, my heritage is African, Jamaican, uh, Farsi, Indian, Spanish, English, and Scottish. And I, I, I like to recognize that because I think it's important that I acknowledge my background because it shapes who I am and how I see the world. So inclusive design, exclusive design really is what I'm gonna be talking about today. And I'm gonna start that off with a story and that story starts in the 1980s. And this is me, um, very young me uh, with my husband. And we were um, in the UK and we had a design studio and this was, um, this was a sentence that was said to us in a boardroom when we did a very large presentation for one of the largest associations in Britain. We, did, we just completed the presentation and the president of the association sat back in his chair and literally said, I didn't know black people could design. And with that, he stood up and started to applaud the presentation that we'd just given. And then all the other executives in that boardroom stood up and applauded the presentation as well. And every time I've, I've told people this story, they always say to me, oh my God, what a racist thing to say. Um, and I said, no, you know, when this man said that, this 60 year old white male um, said that, I didn't know black people could design. It wasn't racist, it was a revelation. Well, of course he didn't know black people could design because this man lived in a world that was built for him, this operated in a colonial system, built for him and was probably never exposed to any kind of black professional. And maybe the only black people he'd ever actually come across were the ones who cleaned his office. So for me and for us, it was a teachable moment. It was, some, it was a moment that opened somebody's eyes. Um, but if we also look at inclusion and systems, you know, in the 1950s, when we had immigration, um, there were systems specifically built to keep people out. And even within employment with immigration, um, I don't know if people know this, but it was actually mandated that immigrants could only do certain types of jobs. Even down to community level, where people were being excluded from um, accommodation and housing, uh, these are the sort of signs you would see in the windows if you were looking for a place to live and you were of Indian or um, African or Caribbean heritage or Irish. So really the question for me is who is acceptable in our inclusion? So when I was in the UK, I actually started a design program for women ex-offenders and um, teaching them how to um, design basically and teaching them all the functions of graphic design to get them into a, a foothold on the ladder into into design and these are women that were they were hurt they they'd lost trust um, they guarded their emotions um, emotionally and physically and you know but they had talent but no one was looking at this group of women to say that actually you know we can actually open the door and include them um, into the design industry young black males the most feared and yet the most vulnerable in our society um, are also excluded and not thought about how we can bring them in because of that, that fear and that unknowing. So um, in my studio, we started a black youth training scheme to bring them in 
and to train them in graphic design because a lot of these youth had been rejected by society, didn't do well in educational institutions, they weren't, they didn't feel safe in those places. Um, and so we would bring them in, we would train them and give them a foothold in the design industry. And so I'm going to show you just a few other organizations kind of bring it up to date in the 21st century here. We have an organization called Black Boys Code here in Canada and also in the US, training young boys how to um, code in STEM, so science, technology, uh, engineering and maths to get them a foothold on the, uh, in the industry. There's also Black Girls Code um, in the US that does a very similar thing. So teaching kids from a very early age about um, the whole STEM field. Um, at OCAD University, there are a few initiatives. We have It's My Future Toronto initiative for young black BIPOC youth. Um, and that's headed up by our um, famous Dean, uh, Dean Dory Tunstall. Um, there's Design Explorer um, in the US again, and with Design Explorer, they're working with Black and Latinx children uh, in, de in design thinking. So this is actually happening on the ground, and they're doing some amazing work. And then the older children, uh, sorry, the older youth, they're actually getting them into work placement um, as designers. And this is one of the young men that they featured um, on the Design Explorer Twitter page. His name is Morris McBride. And he, <clears throat> excuse me, um, he just did a project for his thesis and it was Black Men Don't Cry. And this for me was really poignant because he talks about the vulnerabilities um, that are and emotions that are suffered by Black men, but it's not actually respected um, in society. So this work is being done. And what I really want to talk about is sustainability. And so this work is being done, but how can we sustain it? And so people with power need to listen and be prepared to, and be open for change and to be truly inclusive as well. So that has to be part of what we're trying to do um, now in the 20th, 21st century with this momentum that is happening. And when we talk again, we talk about sustainability. We also have to talk about where is it safe for these people to be and create the safe spaces. And I agree with Priya on that as well. And we also need our allies to stand up and speak out because this can't be something that we do on our own. We need our allies with us to stand strong with us. And I'm going to leave you with a quote from my father, which is, you can be pitiful or you can be powerful, but you can't be both. So pick one. Thank you. What a great expression to leave us with. Thank you for, for sharing that. And and, and, and the, 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 the expansion of the conversation and what you offer, what you've just offered that and, and, and what really resonates with me, obviously as a, a white cis male that's embodied literally much of the systemic um, frameworks that you're implicating in this, being able to and saying the words as part of the creation of these spaces that expand how we understand inclusivity um, is the work of all of us and, and especially um, somebody like myself who embodies a lot of those systems. And so being able to have these dialogues about this and putting it into the work, I think is a, is a powerful gift that you've given us um, today. So thank you, Angela, for that. Um, and thank hopefully, you for all the work you've move, done in that. We can discuss that more. For sure. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our final um, guest, um, Gabriela Gomez Mont, uh, and share a little bit more about her as well. Again, she was the director of the Laboratorio para la Ciudad in Mexico City, um, where she headed a young transdisciplinary team from urban geographers, political scientists, and civic tech experts to artists, historians, and philosophers. The lab was created to tackle urban challenges, creating novel transdisciplinary methodologies and participatory practices, such as crowdsourcing the Mexico City Constitution, uh, continuously exploring ways to find common ground in the gargantuan, diverse, and amazing city, I might add, um, from personal experience. Um, she is the Yale World Fellow, uh, the MIT Directors Fellow, and a Georgetown University Global Cities Initiative Fellow. With that, I would like to invite um, uh, Gabriella to um, share um, some of her amazing um, efforts. Thank you so much, Sean. Incredibly thrilled to be with all of you here and share a little bit of our experience in Mexico City. Um, so I wanted to start even before we get in our hands into the design and everything and speak about inclusivity 
in the very DNA of our societies, which is culture. And that's this question, who actually has the right to imagine? Who has the right to, to foresee or to, to be part of our futures? Um, so I hail from Mexico City, as, as Sean had said, for those of you who have not been there, it is uh, 21 million people in the metropolitan area, nine and a half city proper. And everything that you talk about is in the superlatives. It is at the same time, one of the um, wealthiest cities in the world, but it also has one of the lowest minimum wages of all of Latin America. It, it used to house Mr. Number One Billionaire of, of the world, now paltry number seven. And at the same time, more than 50% of the Mexico City economy is actually from the informal economy. So basically we have always had to, I think, um, in terms of Mexico City, really focus both on the sense of potential, but also the divisive qualities of, of, of the city. And it is most definitely one of the most diverse societies I have ever encountered. And that can be both a huge resource, but also a hindrance. So how do we actually deal with these tensions is a great question because you know we have everything from our, our avenues designed by, um, inspired by Paris champs and and the house mine ideal. And we have, you know, these, um, the, these um, castles in the middle of a park that is three times the size of Central Park. And believe it or not, Mexico City is 60% green areas. And at the same time, 60% of the, the city is also self-constructed. So when you talk about you know, the, the, the co-produced city, this is Mexico City very much in and of itself. So everything from the urban fabric to the socioeconomic um, layers that the city has, we always have to be thinking about the extremes. And, when, and besides the built environment and, and the social aspect of a city, I've always been very intrigued by this place where objective topographies meet social imaginaries. And hence, how do we start also thinking about intervening in the social, infra, the symbolic infrastructure of a city? So one point in case, this is the Socal of Mexico City, our main square. And this is when, when the 15 year old girls came to celebrate their birthday together at the quinceañera that you probably know. But this is actually some months ago as well when the Socal actually turned into an incredible different hue. And it was one of the largest women protests around the world where feminists of the city and, and other places actually got together to speak about the 11 femicides that happen every day across Mexico, which is drastic. So we, this is the way that the city will completely change. So one of the things that I'd like to put forth is how do we start redefining creative plus urban practices? How, does, how can design actually have a different role in the social urban makeup of our societies? So I was chief creative officer of Mexico City for almost six years, um, founded Laboratorio para la Ciudad, which as Sean mentioned, was an incredibly transdisciplinary team. Um, I won't mention the, the because he already uh, talked about some of the disciplines, but it was also quite a young team. It was about eight, 28 years on average. So I also like to think that we were prototyping what government could look like for a new generation of people that are really interested in sinking their hands into the city, but very, uh, very mistrustful of the institutions and, and very bored by them, to be honest. So one of the things that we really started to think about there is how do we think about the interdependency of po political and social imagination? Where does political imagination meet social creativity? And one of the best excuses that we had was uh, when we were tasked with crowdsourcing the Mexico City Constitution. This was something that I, I won't get into the details because it's a long story, but this was historical. This was about upgrading Mexico City um, into even more autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the, the national states. And you know, in the US and I think in the UK as well, uh, um, definitely in Mexico, we know sometimes how important it can be for cities to actually have their own agenda. So it was interesting to see how this uh, gathered quite a bit of uh, news the world over because it was a first. Uh, but specifically, I'd like, I'd like to talk about how sometimes we can look and push for the potential of adding layers of, of participatory practices, not only to co-design a specific thing, but how do we actually also think about participatory practices to imagine our societies, to think about our urban imaginary, to think about the societies who we want to become. And there is no better excuse than a, than a city constitution, which is both a legal document, but also a letter of aspiration. Uh, so basically we joined forces. We had many different layers to this uh, uh, participatory process. One of them was um, make, making an alliance with um, change.org that has a huge amount of following. And we had about half a million people participating there. 
and people, everything from communities to feminists, uh, people with disabilities, as you can see there, it, if their petitions passed a certain number, they were allowed to get together with the, the people that were drafting the, the constitution, as well as if they surpassed the 50,000 signatures, which many of them did, to get together with the mayor himself. So it was really interesting because people such as Patricio that didn't even have, um, he was 17 years old, so he couldn't even vote at the time, actually nowadays has some of his ideas in the constitution. But we knew that this was very specifically catering to an activist community that usually engages with sticks and stones in their hands with government. But we also knew that it was very important to, to also be able to address people that might not want to spend two months of their life helping us draft like this very intense uh, legal document, but also to talk about the city that they want, how what they feel are the biggest obstacles, the biggest pains and the pleasures of the city. Um, as well as how they imagine the future of Mexico City. So we did an uh, urban imaginary survey that queried 31,000 people across 1,400 neighborhoods because we didn't want to, to not take into account the digital divide. We actually partnered with uh, many universities. The biggest university in Mexico has 350,000 students. So that's a huge resource when you think about it correctly. Um, so we went to many corners of the world to mark the places. We, there was also like this media thing of imagine your city where we know that all of these people were surveyed because there, there's actually documentation of all the, the places that these students actually went and surveyed people. And then that actually ended up uh, being a tool that was incredibly useful, not only for the constitution, but also for us at the lab, where now you could actually um, mix data objective data, if you will, with the urban imaginaries of the city. So you could, by gender, age, uh, neighborhood, many other variables, you could actually see what the biggest challenge is, as well as the biggest potential that people think the city has. So really think about that subjective city. Um, but also we could do the same thing, querying about what the future of Mexico City looked like, an ideal future. And to our big surprise, one of the things that we found that I'm sure is true for many cities, unfortunately, is that even though we were prompting for positive futures, mostly what we got back were dystopic Mad Max scenarios of Mexico City basically imploding, that I think if we had done this during COVID times, <laughs> the sense of catastrophe would have been even closer. So that started actually a whole avenue of exploration within the lab as well of how do we actually engage more people in the right to imagine the future of Mexico City. Um, as I mentioned, we could actually cross that data, for example, with seeing how people are envisioning the future with socioeconomic indexes or Gini index and whatever, and really make some very interesting correlations between the subjective city and the objective data. Um, the constitution ended up having really interesting repercussions. This is now a legal document. Um, there's everything from euthanasia laws in place to trend the, some of the most sophisticated transsexual rights on the whole continent uh, are also up on a constitutional level. And more than 87% of the projects actually made it into the Mexico City Constitution, besides the, whole, the work that the mayor and the, the, the team did. And one of the things that I'm also quite proud of is that myself at the team worked very closely with the first mayor of Mexico City that was at the time the, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, working on Article 20 of the Mexico City Constitution where um, we not only spoke about new notions of urban diplomacy and having Mexico City be able to sign its own international treaties, but also uh, naming it Sanctuary City. So when you heard about the caravan um, on its way to the US that was very politicized, a lot of media because it was election times, if you remember this, the reason why instead of being received in Mexico City uh, by police force, and uh, or by police and military, et cetera, et cetera, they, they actually were received by doctors and social workers, et cetera, et cetera, was because of Article 20 of the Mexico City Constitution. So just to say that policy can make reality malleable. Um, one of the really interesting things in the Mexico City Constitution that I thought I had 17 minutes, not seven, so I won't get into that second bit but I will leave that there. Um, so one of the things that is in the Mexico City Constitution is the right to the city. And as you probably know, uh, it is one of the most sophisticated ways of dealing with human rights in a city, but it is also incredibly poetic in nature when you think about Lefebvre and, and David Harvey, where, it's, where they say that the ultimate right to the city is the right to imagine the city because first we create our cities and then the cities create us. 
So I was going to go into how we actually grounded that in specific actual projects, but I will stop there and happy to, to um, join the conversation with all of you. Thank you, Gabriella. I think the the what you've offered is a is a is a great way to segue because it is an invitation to ask a series of questions about um, the spaces that you um, um, are impacting so um, significantly. And so I think with that, I would invite all of the panelists um, to to um, and all of the presenters today to um, uh, uh, come come to the foreground um, and um, maybe start. We have uh, some time to. Um, both field some questions from the, the Q&A that has been uh, coming up over the course of the conversations, um, uh, as well as some of the prompts that maybe we have for each other going through that. And um, uh, there are a couple that maybe I could start us off with. I know we probably each already have our own because this is a conversation, um, but um, Vivian on our Q&A has asked some questions around um, all of the amazing work that all of you are doing, what are some of the, as a, as a person coming to this kind of work, what are some of the, just the challenges of, of, of uh, launching into um, some of these efforts um, as somebody that's invested in, in that process? Whether that is working with transdisciplinary groups and the challenges that come out of that, or it is operating within a structure that's not meant to support, but rather suppress that in a community or in an organization? And what are ways that kind of you have maybe navigated some of that? Okay, I, I could jump in here if I'm not muted. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think that there, there'll always be challenges and the fact that there are challenges, I don't think that should sort of put anybody off. Um, you can make the case uh, as to why things should change. Um, and especially in the times that we're, we're in now, I think if anybody were to make some kind of suggestion to their boss or whoever, that you know maybe we need to think about our organization. I think we're in a time now when it'd be very rare, I think for even someone to say, no, I don't think we should be doing that now. But you know, there's and there's lots of good work that you can use as precedent in terms of well, this is what's happening in, in this arena. And if we talk about you know what Priya is doing, you know this is what's happening within law. So there's lots of support there um, if you want to sort of take any of these kind of initiatives forward. Thank you for that, Angela. Would anybody else like to speak to that, or we can move on to the next question? Sure. Um, so perhaps two of the biggest challenges, um, but also incredibly interesting in, in the context of Mexico City, was I think that when you you have such an important mandate to actually think about inclusion practices in the scope and the space of a, as I mentioned, both a, a um, very diverse but also divided city, it is also possible to get stuck in the crises mode. So how do you grapple with both the, the sense of potential that a city can have, as well as the critical spaces that you need to create a dialogue with and, and really think about both things at once? Um, so that would be one. And the second bit would be in terms of transdisciplinary practices. My team was highly transdisciplinary. And rather than actually, let's say, think that we did design methodology or a certain type of methodology, we would actually do bespoke methodologies depending on the project at hand. So the, the part of the examples that I was going to show later was how our the urban geography department actually worked on uh, worked on spatial justice, as and added a layer of community practices to the things that we were doing in terms of um, the right to play and and public and access to public space and whatnot. So I think at the beginning, it was very difficult to understand how instead of coming together and watering down our own languages, we were each more, the, more than the sum of our parts. Um, but in the end, that actually became one of the biggest strengths of the lab. So as Angela was saying, I think that you know, there, there's definitely challenges, but I think it's well worth pushing through. And that perhaps is part of the design challenge, that instead of thinking that these constraints are where the conversation ends, you know that there's those constraints and those frictions, and then Part of the design of the strategy is how do, do you go forward from that, uh, knowing that it will be inevit inevitable. And just to add a couple of thoughts from, from my side, I think 
when we first started the work in our organization, it was a little bit of an uphill struggle when we first started the reverse mentoring scheme. Some people were incredibly open to it. Some people couldn't see that people that they considered to be doing just as well as them maybe faced other barriers. So it took a long time and a number of conversations and it will take a number more conversations to, to change those mindsets. Um, and the second thing is how do you actually affect change in an organization like mine, which has 32,000 people in it. And I wanted to pick up on something Gabriella said, which is, it is about setting up a participatory system. So you shouldn't have anything about us without us involved. And, um, but you need both things. You need buy-in at the most senior levels of the organization, but you also need to source your ideas and involve the people who are closest to the issues so we are now kind of um, using both our employee networks as well as um, our CEO to speak to each other and actually implement that change because I think you need both things to make it happen. Thank you all for um, um, uh, sharing that. Uh, I, I would I would pivot that a little bit and, in a, and kind of merge it with the question that came earlier for Joanne and Gail, um, which is in in relationship to to the goals you're trying to achieve in that space. How do you deal with the perceptions that people bring to the 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 publicness of toilets? And even in the I could see in the the question and answers there was this low use percentage, but a high desire percentage for more. That seemed to be kind of contradictory. Um, understandings of it. So what are ways that you're, you struggle with that or, or have been kind of addressing that, particularly when you think through kind of really engaging with um, the, the cultural perceptions that different communities bring even um, to those kinds of spaces in the expo? Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite challenging, but it's really creative in many ways in trying to, it opens up really creative ways of engaging with different communities who at the end of the day share the same need but may have that lovely layer of culture that somehow differentiates that need you know we all we all have a bladder and a bowel and maybe some of us have stomas and and bags and you know and, a, and a, you know we need to use the loo but we do have this, this layer of, of culture that sort of stops that. So I think, you know, it is a challenge, but I think one of the joys of, you know, of doing this is creatively finding ways to encompass that challenge and meet that challenge so that you can be more inclusive and so that you can um, open people's eyes to the needs of the other people. Um, we've often done workshops together with groups of people. And what we find often is that when one person actually talks about their experience that they're they're having, somebody else goes, oh yes, I've never, I've never, I've never seen it that before. I've never thought of it that way before. So bringing people together through inclusive design and these creative processes somehow, you know, can help broaden their their, their perception, especially of this tiny little cubicle such as a toilet. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have a few more minutes left. Um, I'd like to certainly um, uh, open the opportunity for anybody that uh, is in the panel or that has been a guest and, and Rama to, if there are any uh, questions that you would like to foreground as part of um, our conversation, um, um, certainly I would uh, um, say that this could be space for that that happened as well. So I think um, I'm actually gonna, I'm just looking at the Q and A um, poll and RCA team, if we can capture all the questions, you know, if we don't get to all of them, we'll certainly do that afterwards. Um, but the, there's a top couple, um, which will sort of roll into one. So, um, anonymous attendee, I don't know who that is, but if you can give us a wave, um, asks how much of a role does culture play in the process of inclusive design? You know, has there been a time when culture has actually inhibited or informed decision making? And the the other one was just to Priya, 
um, asking about what types of responses did you get from your mentees? What did they learn? So if we could um, uh, roll those two together, who would like to go first? Maybe Priya, we can just start with your question. It was named, it was name tagged for you. <laughs> sure, I'm happy to answer that. I, I assume that was a question about our reverse mentoring scheme. Um, and as I touched on earlier, we had a range of responses depending on on the individual's concern so um some people were incredibly open to it and as i said we we found areas of commonality um and others actually um challenged challenged us quite a lot in terms of um were the issues that we were describing really connected to issues of diversity and inclusion? Um, or was it something else? Didn't everybody have those same issues? And so, um, and the other challenge was that, you know, I can obviously speak only of my personal perspective and it was important to communicate it that I was just sharing an individual perspective. Um, so we had a range of a range of responses, but but ultimately, I hope that in different ways, people took something away from it. Thank you. And to throw that question, the second question out of what role does culture play? And has there been a time when culture has actually inhibited or informed decision making? So it could be a positive or a negative response. And Angela or Gabriella, do you want to jump in on that? Some quick responses at this stage. Yeah, I Okay. Yeah, I, I would, I would say um, it, it, it makes a, a huge difference. And I, I would say it, it can be positive and negative. It, it just depends on what the, the project is. Um, from my perspective, in terms of what I've done, um, culture plays a huge role, but also um, society as well. So how one is either treated in society or positioned in society. I think you, you you then sort of view the world slightly differently. And I think like when I was taking on the opportunity to teach the women ex-offenders graphic design, some of the pushback I got was, oh, well, what if they come back and steal all the equipment, um, right? So that, that, that issue was never, not something that really came to my mind, um, but to me, it was like, well, okay, well, if they do come back and steal the equipment, they steal the equipment. So we'll just have to, we've got insurance, we'll just have to get it again. But you can't let distrust um, stand in the way. And I would also like to say that culture is, is, is not a flat sort of blanket thing that you're dealing with. You're dealing with, um, you know, every person has a, has a, has a maybe an, a cultural identity, but then with that might come with their gender identity, which is another culture, or um, their family identity, which leads to another culture. So culture isn't just this sort of blanket thing that we'll, our cultures are very, very multi-layered. So every time that we go into these, these scenarios and these design situations, we're having to unpick quite complex cultures. And I think that's one of the, the richness of our multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary um, practices that we actually bring in within design. Um, if, I, if I may jump in, I, I actually think culture is a great a priori, like it, th this is basically our DNA where everything starts. And one of the things that we found at the lab was that getting um, to know a little bit what the subjective city looks like, the subjective lives, and not only objective data was incredibly important um, to all of our projects. And, in, and many times, some of the most productive work that we did was reframing the question itself. Um, so let's say when everything was in, from organizing the Uber versus taxi debate that got insanely heated in, the, in, in Mexico City to working on the constitution, which, you know, so many young people thought is this like boring document that, you know, why, why would I care? It all starts with reframing, but to reframe, you actually first need to understand what are the biases, the metaphors that we're using, the language with which we speak about things. So yeah, I, I think that we should be thinking a lot deeper about uh, deep culture, if you will. So, so yes. I think that's a perfect point on, on uh, which to end. A, a few um, closing comments. And I think if the panelists, if you can stay online after, after this, we, we'll just uh, wrap up internally. But it just, it just strikes me, hearing the breadth and depth of experience, um, that you know we all live on one gorgeous little planet 
we um, have access to one set of resources. Um, inclusivity starts with an individual, but it can reach its arms right out to the globe. The same sun rises and sets on us all every day, but that day could be radically different depending on our age and ability, the heartland of inclusive design, but expanding that out to start to look at issues around culture, race, geography, gender, toileting, um, you know, landscaping, context, culture, socioeconomic circumstance means that we have a lot to do. I always love the idea of working inclusive in, in inclusive design because I feel I'm trying to do myself out of a job. We have this goal that there is a point in time when design is just design. It doesn't need to be inclusive where humans are just humans. You're not classified by your gender or your skin color or your ability or your looks. And I think that is one of the very powerful things that I'm taking away from this. So I wanted to end with a short um, quote because this kind of work can seem like there's a mountain of work ahead of us. It's a long journey. And, you know, Angela, thank your father for talking about pity or power, um, because I think, you know, we need that power, that energy and that grit. Um, but the right level to start at is your level, wherever that is and whatever that means, even if it's reflection or realization, or even if that means, you know, running a nation. Um, when I was 14 and I was feeling very inadequate, like I didn't know what I was going to do. And I talked to my mother about this and she gave me a quote from Tagore, who was India's poet laureate. And it just, it's just this, it's four lines. It's who will take up my work asked the setting sun and throughout the land, no one answered. Alone in the corner, dusty and forgotten, the earthenware lamp said, I will my Lord as best I can. So we don't need to be the sun or the moon with this work, just be a clay pot. So wishing you all inclusive and social endeavors and much love to you all. Take care, do join us again tomorrow for inclusive design in business impact, which is the flip side of the coin, but love to you all. Thank you for staying with us and speak to the panelists in a minute.